some of her presentations in the past. And, you know, they're really good, they're really exciting. And so, today I'm really excited about today's presentation because she's always been able to do good speaking, good presentations, and so I think we're all gonna have to listen to her presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a big round of applause for our first speaker of the evening, Dr. Kualoha Bo and Alanui. Legends 
are the stories of our heroes and our ancestors, but also the stories that explain and express our Hawaiian worldviews, values, practices, and knowledge, which is generally called folklore and then folk tales or stories in particular. Within this very, very large and diverse category of what we would now call literature and in the field that I work in that includes folklore, uh, oral tradition or oral narratives, before stories were written down, they were told orally. Um, um, including with that is mele. And mele is a general term for poetry and then performance of mele in different forms. So it can be chanted with, with holy, it can be sung, um, and then of course, it's performed through hula and other kinds of storytelling. So this became one of my passions, and so my little nickname for myself is I'm just a word nerd. And within a more specific context of Hawaiian words and, and Hawaiian mokololo, um, and within this frame of Mele. So I wanted to start off with, I came to this idea that what I could share is the work that I've been doing on Mele Inoa for Kamoli. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit with you. It's, it's a, a project that's still in process, um, and it's very exciting for me to, to be able to be working on these ballets and unraveling some of the poetic mysteries, at least mysteries to, to me, um, as a lifelong student of our language and, and culture. Um, so this project began a few years ago. I have a colleague who teaches rhetorics. And she wanted to collaborate on an article for an international collection of essays on non-Western rhetorics. And this is really was interesting to me because she's a classically trained Western rhetorician along the line of Socrates, for example, um, who wanted to write something about, and I always say this word wrong, I actually had to write a note to myself, epideptic, epideptic or praise forms of rhetoric um, in Hawaiian culture. And so, you know, we talked story for a little bit and thought about what we could focus on in research. And we thought about the concept of Mele, you know, right, name songs. Um, that this would be very valuable and informative. First, because it's a highly recognized form of Hawaiian poetry. Um, it's very ancient, but it's also very contemporary. We still compose today Mele, you know, for people of our time. Um, that is similar to Mele Inoa that have composed for generations past, hundreds of, of years and hundreds of generations. Um, which tells us it was important to our ancestors and it's important to us. It survived and it's thrived across really long span, uh, spans of time, as well as radical changes in Hawaiian culture and society. Also because of somebody who composes poetry and analyzes poetry overall, it's demonstrated incredible complexity, diversity, and adaptability. And then also because it was something that we we're personally really fascinated by and really couldn't find a lot of information about it. There's a lot of information on what a Melanoma is. We can just start with a point dictionary and it will give us a basic definition. There are any number of really accomplished scholars who work with Bele Kumukula um, who talk about the importance of Bele Inoa and include Bele Inoa in their repertoire of song and chant and dance with their poem. But there was very little information about how Bele Inoa operate as cultural forms of rhetoric that were and still are admired and respected. So our article fo focused on three specific Mele Inoa from three distinctly different historical time periods. So the first was a Mele Inoa for Kamuli that was composed in the pre-Western contact period of the 18th century by his mother, Kamakalele. A Mele, the second one was a Mele Inoa for Kuriliu Okulani that was composed in the 1890s after the overthrow that praised her efforts in advocating for the restoration of Hawaiian sovereignty and her trip to Washington, D.C. And the third was one that was composed in the early 21st century for U.S. President Barack Obama upon winning his first election, which was composed by Mona Boy. Each Mele is composed roughly a century apart. Each one highlights the love years in distinctly 
different cultural and political contexts. The first for Kongoli'i, Hawaii was still under traditional and religious and political system. The second, Hawaii was recently an independent monarchy and had been overthrown and was in flux in the period of uh, the provisional government. And then the third, uh, Hawaii as a U.S. state. So today I'm going to focus just on the Mele Inoa for Kamuli. Um, the book chapter uh, that we submitted uh, was approved and the book will be published later this year if you're more interested about the, the larger subject. Um, and what we hope to do is encourage people to look closely at other Mele Inoa, not just these three, um, and, and see what we can discover in, in close examination. My particular, so my colleague's particular interest is looking at rhetoric, right, what it is, how it functions within culture, and it's really exciting because it's something we've never really talked about within the larger span of my literature before, right? So a lot of people think literature is this one big category, and what we've been doing over the last decade or so with my classes um, and students um, with different kinds of books, Hawaiian and related Pacific literature is to break it out. And I recall when I was a graduate student back in the 90s, one of our senior faculty at the time stopped me in the hall, threw me a hand, like the girl stop, and she said, Kumoha, just exactly what do you plan on doing with Hawaiian literature? Like, is there even enough for one class, for one semester? And I looked at her and I smiled and I said, I'm going to do the same thing that you do. Periods, genres, and authors. What did I say? And she looked really com like confused, like really. And so this is just one strand of that, right? The the genre, and not just Mele, which is huge, but bringing it down to Mele Inoa. In this case, one particular period for one particular reason. So first off, let's look at a brief overview on Mele and Mele Inoa. So as we I would argue every culture around the world, poetry, and formed poetry, spoken word, uh, to song, to chant, is the oldest verbal art form. And this is true within my culture as well. Thus, it's always been important and always been an integral form of expression to voice the thoughts, emotions, and aspirations of the people. Mele are songs, they're chants, at the basis, their poetry. Their rhythmic compositions, rich with symbolism and imagery of all kinds that shape our understanding of Hawaiian history, culture, and people. Accurate interpretations of Mele, particularly older Mele, can be very challenging as meanings of words change, use of words change, and I like to use the analogy with my students, it's like reading Shakespearean English in the modern time, and then reading Chaucer, which is older, and so forth. We're still reading English, but the words, the usage, everything over hundreds of years is very different, and, and we shouldn't expect anything less of my language as well. Lots of changes over time, just with, with use. And even with modern English, you know, words come into play and, and leave. And there are many times as an older person, I scratch my head when around the younger ones. Like, That's not what that meant when I was growing up. It was a really bad thing to pick something. And, you know, now that's even an old expression that the younger, younger ones were like, what is that? So we have that in our, in our non culture and language. Concrete words are more common then abstract concepts is one of one of the challenges. So we can look at a word and interpret it at one level, but we may not necessarily be able to interpret much, um, other meanings or layers of meaning. Um, one of, just one example of this is that we have words for specific colors, and we have multiple words or synonyms for specific colors, like red or shades of red black and qualities of black, but there's no old word for the color, right? The concept of color doesn't exist. We have a newer word, I call the blue, but it's not an old word. Um, and so in this way, now they are often very highly figurative with lots of symbolism, 
and they rely on what Hawaiian language professor uh, Oliveira has called sense-ability, right, your senses. And so one of the first things I start with in teaching poetry, what kinds of imagery do we utilize? And a lot of people think of five. I'm like, okay, there's several, seven general ones. Um, so there's, you know, sight, sound, smell, taste, touch. There's kinesthetic, which is movement. There's tactile, which is the feeling of something outside your body. And there's organic, or what we call my bowel feelings, like internal sensation. And all of these are well represented in Hawaiian poetry and imagery, especially with, with older forms. And so along with these types of, multiple types of imagery, hyperbole, exaggeration, personification of nature, similes, metaphors, all kinds of figures of speech, um, it becomes important to try to analyze and then interpret what the actual picture the poet is trying to convey. So I always ask people to think of a melee in words, or in a melee as a visual image, but with words. And if your mind can interpret the visual of the words, you'll get a beautiful Bill Parker painting, just with words. So one of the things we know is that if you can access the imagery, it demonstrates what we know of the power of words. In words, in language, is the power of life and death. And we know, just had some interesting conversations earlier today with some friends, that this can be very literal. That we have examples for, you know, one of my specialty areas in Mo'olomo is the epics of Pele and her sister Iyaka. An example where Iyaka is able to chant and a pig dies. And there are other examples she chants and she brings Mo'olomo back to life and other humans brings them back to life. But many times it's also metaphoric where we say be careful with your words. Because if you tell, as an adult, especially if a parent, grandparent, right, you tell a child, oh, you're so stupid, you know, we're going to mount that baby. That's a whole unlocking. That's a way of killing the spirit and the soul, even if you're not physically killing their life. And when you say, you're so amazing, you're so smart, you did such a good job, that's a whole world, right? That's a way to make somebody feel good and try. And so whether it's physical or whether it's metaphoric, our language, the words that we use, are very common and how they affect other people, as well as ourselves. The other thing about melody that's really important, especially when crafting a melody in your 